What's up, guys? It's Will from RevolutionaryLifestyleDesign.com coming to you today to talk about how to fight depression. This is the most important article on my entire website, and this is going to be the most important podcast that I do. That is because depression in men is an epidemic. It is a silent killer either through a life of quiet desperation or through outright suicide. And the suicide rates of men are something like four times, five times the rates of women because a lot of the time men do not want to seek out help for their problem or they do not want to admit that they're in pain. And in fact, by being in pain, they will beat themselves up even more, um, you know, calling themselves weak and things like that. And I've been there. I know what that's like. And it is a very painful place to be. When the ruling class uh, imposed cultural Marxism on our society uh, close to 40, 50 years ago, they went to war against spirituality, they went to war against nationalism, they went to go to war against the nuclear family, and they went to war against traditional masculinity. And these were the pillars that men would live by. These were the, the roadmaps, the, the tried and tested systems that would give men meaning in their lives, that would give men purpose in their lives. And if you're familiar with Viktor Frankl, the Holocaust survivor and his seminal book, Man's Search for Meaning. He is a therapist who argues that the core purpose of every person's life is to find meaning. And without meaning, um, a person is lost. And with meaning, you are able to survive things even as horrible as the Holocaust. And he outlines... um, you know, his strategies for surviving and, you know, how important it is to find meaning. But when the idea of spirituality, the idea of believing in your country, the idea of having a nuclear family and the idea of traditional masculine concepts that have been passed down from father to son have been stripped from you, this leaves so many men in a position where they don't have a roadmap, they don't have a feeling of purpose in their lives and I'm a product of that I came from a single parent a single mother household and I had absolutely no guidance on how to become a man um, I've made that into a positive because I actively sought out and tested things for myself and I was able to build a business and a website around the things that I've learned but that came at the cost of uh, a lot of pain and with the destruction of the nuclear family many men are in the same boat as I was and many men now suffer from a lack of positive role models they don't have traditional training traditional guidance traditional mental toughness to handle the challenges that they would have learned from their fathers in times past And you combine that with a sense of purposelessness, with cultural atheism, with nihilistic materialism, urban anonymity, a lack of community, wage slavery, debt. And it's no wonder that most guys slip into depression. Um, You know, it... It's, it's completely obvious. The, the only hope for escape for many men is, is doing drugs or alcohol or video games or chasing casual sex. And, and I've done all of these things as a way to try and escape the, my daily reality, which I hated. And the majority of men suffer in silence like I did, uh, not wanting to show weakness, not wanting to burden others with their problems. And if you're listening to this right now, I want to tell you that you're not alone. There is hope, and I'm going to show you exactly how to fight back against depression. But to fight back against depression, you first need to understand what depression is. And it's very simple. Depression is a state that is unhappiness plus despair plus fatigue. Okay? Depression is a state 
and it is a state that is actually combined of three different states unhappiness despair and fatigue and to prove that to you I can tell you that you can't be depressed when you have energy okay this is very important to understand in terms of controlling your energy levels when you're upset and you have energy the the result is anger but you cannot be depressed when you have high energy depression automatically limits the amount of energy available to you anger is what results when you're unhappy and have energy anger is unpleasant but can be used as motivation and is nowhere as crippling as depression okay depression is also different from sadness because with sadness there's at least a release when you cry sadness is much easier to control you know, maybe you watched a sad movie or had a sad memory or something like that, and you can cry, and, and you know, sometimes that's enough. With depression, there is, there's no release. With depression, you lose even the will to fight the feeling because fighting back against that feeling feels pointless. Depression as a whole is a string of negative thoughts and feelings that, that link to um, negative feelings in your physiology or vice versa negative feelings in your physiology manifest themselves in negative thoughts so some of those thoughts would be like i'm a failure life is pointless i have nothing to look forward to and i'm going to experience even more pain in the future so i might as well not even fucking try um like these are the most consistent thoughts that uh that i had that that a lot of guys have uh but it's it you're gonna have your own personal triggers. Out of all the negative states that you can possibly have, depression is the worst one. The feelings of hopelessness, nausea, self-hatred, and, and suicidal ideation are nightmarish. And I, I can remember these feelings very clearly. I, I would not wish that on, on my worst enemy. So what you have to remember is this the number one rule in fighting depression is don't let yourself slip into depression okay it's much more difficult to pull yourself out of a depressive state than to stop yourself falling into one so the number one thing you have to do is play defense and that means doing your best and being consistently vigilant not to fall into a depressive state and being constantly on guard and mindful of your mood so that you can prevent it from happening okay it's like a uh, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth more than a pound of cure so we are playing defense and 90 percent of this is using preventive or pre preventative medicine um, medicine okay so to do this, you need to recognize your major depressive triggers and be able to constantly monitor your mood. So the mental health community has done a good job of, of raising awareness for depression, but it's also created many misconceptions of what depression actually is because depression is not an illness. By, by thinking depression is an illness, it creates a victim mentality and a rationale for making excuses and blaming, blaming your depression. Okay? I'm not saying that there are not generic or genetic factors involved in depression, but depression is a state, no more, no less. It's a physiological state, that, and it is combined as uh, feeling and thoughts, but is a physio physiological state. Okay, And throughout your daily life, you are constantly going from one state to the other, from happy to sad to angry to um, depressed. These are states, okay? This is not an illness. It is a state determined by a combination of your physio physiology and your mentality, okay? It's true that depression has a genetic component and you might be more predisposed to enter that state than others and you might be predisposed because you have lower levels of key neurotransmitters, but you can 100% raise these neurotransmitters naturally and chemically, okay? This is not like diabetes. This is not like cancer. This is not like, um, you know, having a broken arm where you need um, medicine and you need specific 
scientific treatments to fix that, okay? Depression is a state, and it's a state that is within your control. And I'm not telling you that to minimize your pain, and I'm not telling that you that to try and shame you. I'm telling you that to give you hope that you are able to make changes because once you start feeling like depression is out of your control, now you become a victim. Uh, you, you, relinqu- you relinquish your personal power to that depression and then once you achieve that victim status, then you are out of control and you're not able to make positive changes. But when you take responsibility and you recognize that it's a state, you realize that your state is your mood, your state is your reality, your entire life is just a series of state shifts, and we link external events to our state, but in reality, your state is completely internal. You have complete control over your state, okay? You don't have control over the things that happen to you, but you have 100% control over how you react to those things, okay? And if there's one thing you're going to take from this podcast, I recommend you take that. You have complete control over your state at all times, okay? I'm not saying that I don't get mad. I'm not saying that I don't have negative states. You know, it's a daily battle, but I recognize that I am in control of these things. No matter what happens to me, no matter how many bad things happen to me, I am in control of my reaction. And there is no situation where understanding that is not is not beneficial, okay? There is no situation where um, trying to control your state in a positive way is not beneficial. Even if, say, you lost a loved one and something, you know, or something horrible like that happened, even if you can increase your mood by only 10%, that is beneficial, okay? It is 100% beneficial every time to be able to control your state. Um, so now that you understand what depression really is and that you have control over it, I'm going to outline for you the most common triggers and the three lines of defense in your battle. They are controlling your lifestyle, using your state boosters, and the last line of defense is knowing how to fight your way out of a depressive state. So these all come from personal experience in my own fight against depression, and I promise you that everything I outline works. And I can tell you guys that it does get better. At 33, um, with the steps that I've taken, it, depression for me is like a long, long lost memory. I don't get into a depressive state more than maybe once or twice a quarter, and it does not last more than, you know, usually half a day. Maybe at most I'll have a day where I'm feeling really low, but maybe once out of 150 days. And that is a massive, massive improvement. From 10 years ago, you know, at 21, I, I would be, or, or 12 years ago, I would be in depressive states as many as four, five days out of a week, okay? In high school, in grade nine and 10, it was even worse. It was almost every day of the week was a constant depression. And I can tell you guys from personal experience, you implement the stuff that I outlined for you, you are going to be amazed and thrilled with how much you can change your life and how better your life can be. Um, So let's get started with your triggers. So I'm going to outline the the four, or sorry, the three most common triggers. Uh, Number one is illness or physical pain. And this is the hardest one to deal with, okay? Um, Because illness or physical pain changes your physiological state. And it's a change that that physiological state is sometimes something that is very hard to control. You know, if you have cancer or something like that, your physiological state is going to be horrible. And a lot of that's going to be out of your control because being sick sends hundreds of negative anchors and triggers um, throughout your body into your mind. And it also reduces key neurotransmitters like dopamine, serotonin, 
and uh, GABA, which makes it that much easier to slip into depression. Um, so it's extremely important that you take as good care of your health as possible. One thing that I did was I stopped drinking milk and I moved to a country where there were no seasons, uh, where Thailand, it's, it's hot all year round. Uh, back in Toronto, I would usually get sick every time the seasons changed. And when I stopped drinking milk, which was, I, which was what I was allergic to, um, I stopped getting congested and I stopped getting colds all the time. So now I maybe get one cold a year and it, having a cold, you know, knocks my mood down by probably about 35% or maybe about 30%. And there's a massive difference between how I feel when I'm feeling great and the first days of a cold. So that's an area where you want to make sure to eat as healthy as possible and to avoid, you know, sickness like the plague. If your girlfriend is sick, then don't be around her because you need to treat this like, like it's your like it's your job, okay? Because this is how serious um, depression is. And you need to go above and beyond what the average person does. The average person can get sick and it's not a huge deal, but you need to recognize that this is a danger zone for you and you need to really be on guard against getting sick. Second trigger, doing what you hate. Um, this could mean working a job that you hate when you see no way out, uh, family ob obligations, trying to please people, or any restriction on your freedom and, hap and pursuit of happiness. The best decision I've made in the last 10 years or so was committing myself 100% to building, a, building my own business where I don't have to work a job. I worked in sales for many years and, and, and I hated that job with the plague. My mood increased at least 30% by not having to go and, and do sales, maybe 40%. That's how much I hated an office job, okay? If you, it's, it's gonna be very difficult for you guys if you work a job to um, not do what you hate because nine times out of 10, most people don't like their job and you're there's so much that you're not in control of. You're not in control of the people you work with. You're not in control of how your boss talks to you. You're not in control of um, your resources. So there is going to be, in general, that's probably going to be the most likely area where you're, where you're doing something that you hate. And as you guys know, I recommend your main mission in life being, you know, building something great that's going to sustain you financially. Um, I built Revolutionary Lifestyle Design and I love it. And I love every single day of, of working on my business and um, of reaching out to you guys and talking to you guys and, and, and being able to do what I love. And that's a massive difference, okay? And cutting out negative people and negative family members, massive difference. Uh, so that is, that is trigger number two, okay? And... Trigger number three is nihilism. And if you are an intellectual or an intelligent guy, this is a real dangerous one, and it was for me. I was reading Nietzsche at 13, and I, I can tell you that was not a good path to go on. Thinking things like life is pointless and it doesn't matter that we all die, um, you know, we all die in the end, is like the some of the nastiest um, ways of thinking. And it is very easy to start thinking like that when you analyze the world from a purely rational perspective. But at the end of the day, you also have to deal with the, the fact that there is no objective meaning in life, okay? At first thought, that can seem very negative, but when you break it down and when you actually understand what Nietzsche was saying, which I didn't understand as a young kid, it gives you an amazing sense of freedom. Although there might be no objective meaning, you create whatever meaning you want, okay? You can create any kind of life you want and you can attach as much or as little meaning to that as possible. And 
you can get as much involved in that meeting as you as you want and that is an amazing thing okay in many ways you can look at life as a game and if there's no objective meaning it doesn't matter is there you know when you were a kid and you were playing video games was there an objective meaning to that no but you had a ton of fun and you had a mission for beating the boss and you could play it with your buddies and and it was a great time so life is what you make of it okay instead of um, making your life a hell you can make your life a heaven you can have women in your life you can have a business that you love you can live in a nice country where it's warm all the time and I'm telling you guys the only time people drift into nihilism is when they're unhappy. Okay, if you lived in the Playboy Mansion and you had access to Playboy Playmates and you had an unlimited bank account, you wouldn't be worried about nihilism because you'd just be like, "Man, I, I don't care. I'm, I'm going to enjoy my life." You know, so that is the cure for nihilism: is you need to find meaning in your life. You need to be on a mission, and you need to have happiness as your main priority. And when you do those things. Nihilism is going to have no effect on you. So next up, lifestyle. So here I'm going to get into the lifestyle hacks that you should use on a day-to-day -day basis for, um, for boosting your mood and for having a consistent mood. Number one, spirituality. If you're an atheist or an agnostic guy, just tune this out. Um, I believe in more than the material world. I'm not a creationist. I do not. I think the religious ideas are allegories. However, um, it is a nice feeling to have faith in something greater than yourself uh, in terms of meaning and, and peace and comfort. Pure materialism is empty and hollow, and it's really poorly disguised, disguised nihilism, okay? I'm not talking about religion, but I'm talking about a belief that, um, you know, we are more than just this material body and that after this temporary life is over, we return to a state of oneness and a, a state of love and um, that oneness of God. This is a powerful tool to think about in your optional, but I'm not going to preach to you guys. And if you're committed atheist, just ignore this. But if you're a committed atheist or committed um, agnostic, Here's how I would interpret spirituality. So instead of spirituality being like a faith in a higher power or something like that, it can be, um, you know, you can use it as like you're going to do good things for people or you're going to give to charity or you're going to do, you're going to use like a humanist version of spirituality. So something that is outside of your um, general uh, selfishness that's going to make other people feel good. I, I'm able to do that through my blog. I'm not a big fan of, of um, you know, I don't, I don't give people random gifts and stuff like that. I, I, I get my value out of helping guys on my blog. So my mission and my finances and, and helping people is all intertwined, which is really nice to have. But um, for you guys, Finding something where you can make other people happy uh, really makes you feel good. So if that's volunteering at a charity or giving some of your money or your time, I highly recommend uh, doing that. Next up, proper sleep. Getting proper sleep is crucial for keeping your energy levels high. Feeling lethargic will destroy your state. And this is the more true as you get older. So you got to make sure you can get six to eight hours a night. And some of you guys might actually function. I function better on, on maybe seven hours than, than on eight. But you, what you want to do is you want to keep your sleep cycle consistent. Um, you want to be going to sleep at night instead of being up at night and sleeping during the day. This is going to ensure that your circadian rhythm is um, in proper shape, which is what we're evolved for. Getting proper sleep also strengthens your immune system. In my experience, the number one way for me to get sick is to um, not get proper sleep. If I sleep only like three or four hours a night for even just like two or three nights in a row, I'm going to get a cold. I know that with 90% certainty. 
the sleep is a massive, massive area and it's massively underrated. It is no it is no coincidence that depressed people are night owls. Um, whenever I was in a depressive state, it would be me staying up through the night and getting up later. And what happens is you start getting up at 9, then 10, then 11, then 12. And then sometimes you're getting up at 3 or 4 in the afternoon and it's an absolute mess. I don't know the scientific reason why the circadian rhythm um, is so important, but it is. It is massively important, and I've tried. I've tried to, you know, com- you know, be able to combine feeling good and being able to stay up late, but it is not possible. It is waking up early. I'm up at six or seven every day, drinking water and getting caffeine. Makes me happy. I've become a morning person. It is extremely, extremely important to get proper sleep and to wake up uh, early. And all you guys have to do is test it out for a week. And I'm telling you, not only will does it affect your mood, um, but then there's the secondary factor of, of shame. So when you're waking up at three or four, Whether you feel this consciously or subconsciously, you're going to feel like a scumbag. When everyone's just finishing their workday and you're just getting up, you're going to feel really out of touch with society and that's going to have a big effect on your mood. So to summarize, get proper sleep, go to sleep from, you should be going to sleep at like from 9 p.m. till midnight and the ideally you're waking up at 6 to like 7.30. Again, Avoiding sickness, as I said before, sickness is a massive state destroyer. It's very difficult to pull out of negative or depressing states. One thing I forgot to mention was I take five grams of vitamin C, time-released vitamin C at the first sign of a cold, and that many times will prevent the cold, and if it doesn't prevent the cold, it is gonna lessen the symptoms by about 50%, and then I will continue for the the duration of the cold. I will up that to about 10 grams of, of um, time released vitamin C for the cold. Time released because if you if it's not time released, it's gonna um, loosen your bowels, so to speak. So you want the time release stuff that's gonna be slowly released throughout the day. And I take as much as 10 grams, so that's a mega dose, and that's gonna knock off like 50% of the cold symptoms, and it's gonna um, cut the cold down by about half. So I used to have like two week colds, but that cut my cold down to uh, about a week. And if I get it early enough and I hit it with the five grams right away, at least 60% of the time, that's gonna stop the cold in its tracks. Vitamin C is the, the most powerful antioxidant, and I'm telling you guys, it really does work. Also, you wanna avoid foods you're allergic to. Um, the common ones are, are what's called FODMAPs. You should look that up. For me, the, the, the FODMAPs are dairy, garlic, and onions. If I am consistently eating dairy, garlic, and onions, I am going to get a cold and because I'm allergic to these things and, and they're going to lower uh, my immune system's resistance to, um, to germs and things like that. Next up, drinking lots of water. Feeling relaxed in your body is crucial to your state. Without enough water, your muscles will get tight and you'll become irritable. I suggest you drink four liters of water a day, okay? If you are taking something like Kratom or you drink lots of caffeine, you're gonna need about six liters a day. I use a lot of caffeine, so I drink six liters of water a day, okay? Um, The best way to tell if you have enough water is you wanna see clear urine. If your urine is yellow, it means you're dehydrated. And our bodies are 90% water. We, we run on water. So if you want to have consistent fuel and consistent energy and, um, you know, consistently feeling good throughout the day, being hydrated is a big part of that. And I spent a lot of my life being chronically de- dehydrated without realizing it. And one of the ways that affects you is your muscles become very tight. When you drink a lot of water, your muscles loosen up and it really has a big impact on how you feel. Next up, proper diet. Eating well gives you good, clean energy all day, and this is the backbone of your state. Eating well also prevents massive state killers like stomach pain, lethargy, and bloating. Um, 
what that means is you're, you're going to eat natural foods, stuff that you want to think like uh, as paleo as you can, meat, vegetables, fruits, nuts, uh, rice to some degree, and avoiding FODMAPs or food that you're allergic to. One key factor here for maintaining energy through the day is to keep carbs low to moderate and rely mostly on protein, fat, meats, and nuts. These are great sources of energy for the day and save your carb loading for night, for the nighttime once you're ready to relax and not do anything. Because too many carbs during the day is gonna destroy your energy and you're gonna have to have a nap. And that is, if you're prone to depression, I'm telling you, once you get in that lethargic state, that is one step away from, from the depressive state. So you got to be really careful there. Now, I wish I could tell you that I ate clean 100% of the time, but I don't. This is probably my toughest battle on this list. But what I do do is I 90, 95, 90% of the time I eat clean lunches and I eat a low-carb lunch. So I do intermittent fasting until lunch with lots of water and lots of caffeine and then I will eat a low carb lunch. It'll be like chicken with a bit of rice. Um, a lot of the time I'll just eat sashimi and if you just eat pure meat, especially raw, raw, raw meat like sashimi, either tuna or salmon, it almost has no impact on your energy whatsoever. It'll literally like you can eat lunch standing up and not even get tired at all. Um, whereas if you eat you know, a giant shawarma place with rice and donuts on top of that and a Coke, that's a sleeping pill. You're gonna be lethargic for the next four hours, right? And you see this all the time if, if you work with guys, they have a big lunch and then they're trying not to fall asleep at their desk. That, that is something that you really should avoid. And if you're gonna eat dirty, like eat dirty closer to the nighttime when you know you can have a meal and then it's only like an hour or two before you go to bed. Um, and I don't care if that's against what some of the scientists say eating at night. I, I go on how I feel and how my body feels and I suggest you do the same. So next point, this is similar to the above is intermittent fasting. I've got, um, a ton of articles on my site and a ton of links to that, but the basic general idea is fasting in the morning, especially with combined with caffeine will blunt your appetite and will give you a ton of extra energy and a ton of time in the morning that you would have spent making breakfast. One of the biggest changes in my mood was when I started to get up early instead of being a night owl and I started to drink a ton of water and I started intermittent fasting with caffeine. I am now 100% a morning person. My best energy is from 7 a.m. till noon. Um, I'm doing this podcast right now at 10 a.m. And you guys are, I'm sure, are able to hear the difference between this and some of the ones I do at night. Um, this is where all my energy is. This is my prime time for getting things done. And don't believe that there's such thing as a morning and a night person. You can be either. And being a morning person is so much better for your energy levels and intermittent fasting is such a massive part of that because if I was to eat a big breakfast I would be immediately tired right after that but when you don't eat a big breakfast and you just use a simple stimulant and water I feel terrific so I look forward to getting up okay I put my headphones on I put some positive music on I get the caffeine in I get the water in and within 10-15 minutes I'm feeling terrific every single morning Next up, no ejaculation or ejaculate as little as humanly possible. This is the most powerful state amplifier on this list. If you are going to do one thing to fix your depression, this is it. And I'm not fucking joking. Ejaculation causes massive dopamine crash, testosterone crash, and energy crash. Even from one ejaculation, I will get lethargic. If I, even if I hadn't had an ejaculation in months, if I come at like 2 p.m., my whole day is going to be shot. Okay? My whole energy level, everything. And I will be able to feel the difference in my energy levels for up to seven days later. That might sound crazy to you guys who haven't 
gone long periods without ejaculating, but I'm telling you, it's the truth. Once you stop doing it, you realize how draining it's been to you because your sexual energy is, in Chinese medicine, it's called your chi or your vital energy in your body. And this is not hippie bullshit, guys. This is something that you can feel and it's a massive change. If you don't believe me, try go jerking off for three times and then go to the gym and try and beat your personal bests on the weights, okay? I guarantee you're gonna do that. You're not even gonna be able to lift 30% or you're not even gonna be, you won't even hit 70% of what your personal best is. That's how a dramatic a change in your energy will be. And this gets worse with every year. Um, every year I get older, it takes longer to recover from each ejaculation. When I was 14, I could, I could go 10 times in a day. But as you get older, that's, you have to be very, very um, careful and vigilant about this. Because your sexual energy is your life force. It is the most concentrated, powerful energy in your body. And if you're constantly draining that, it is like, think of a car battery. If you're constantly draining your car battery every day, that battery is gonna run out very quickly. But if you take care of that battery and you drain it as little as possible, it's gonna last for a long time. Here are just some of the things that you're gonna notice with no ejaculation. You're gonna notice brighter moods, better energy, better circulation of your energy, more confidence, more presence, less fear, higher sex drive, major inc increases in the pleasure of sex. And if you can't hold back from ejaculating, I know it's hard, then try and limit it to like once a week, ideally at night before bed. So if you're, if you're really struggling with this, um, then you know, give it like, okay, it's Sunday night, you can look forward to you know, having a girl over or just going at it with your hand. And you've done all your work for the week and you know, you can have that release and it's gonna make the week manageable. You know, if it's really insanely difficult for you to manage, um, then I can understand. This is especially true if you're a younger guy, but try and at least do a reset. Try and do like a monthly reset of no ejaculation for a month to get your systems back in order. And there's two ways you can go about this. So if you guys follow my site, you know that I do um, non-ejaculatory male multiple orgasms. And I have training for free on my site how to do that. That is a very good way to um, not ejaculate once you have that mastered. However, the downside is there is still, it still fucks with your dopamine levels to some degree. So I've gone, my record for no ejaculation is seven months. And that's without any type of masturbation as well. And compared to no porn, no masturbation, no ejaculation, no orgasm, compared to um, using the doing the tantric male multiple uh, or, orgasm ejaculate and without ejaculation, the no masturbation, no porn, no nothing is better for your mood. The reason I use the um, no ejaculation is because the or the the multiple more um, multiple orgasm masturbation without ejaculation is because I really get a lot of enjoyment out of it, and it's sort of like um, it's like a reward for me that I can do daily and not have a major impact and not have the constant draining of ejaculation. So that is better than ejaculation, but even better is nothing. Um, you can still have sex with girls, but just don't come. And I'm telling you, those seven months when I did that, when I did no fap, no porn, no masturbation of any kind, no orgasm, it was the brightest period of my mood, the sharpest uh, presence that I have, your presence goes up massively, the sharpest energy, um, the most bonding type of sex, and it is a, it's an amazing thing to experience, and you really should try it for as long as you can. Um, the first couple weeks is the hardest, but after a month or so, it actually becomes quite easy. The, the problem is just 
go, getting through that first month. But once you get through that first month, you actually kind of lose the craving for ejaculation and it becomes very easy to manage. Um, so I highly recommend you have a look at that. There's all kinds of sites on there for online for NoFap and stuff like that. And I'm telling you guys, it is extremely powerful. So either transition into my multiple non-ejaculatory orgasms um, or do the no fap, no ejaculation completely. I'm telling you, this is the most important thing you can do for managing your mood. Next up, high intensity training. High intensity training is the best way to exercise. It elevates all your key levels like testosterone, growth hormone, GABA, while flooding your body um, without flooding your body with negative hormones like cortisol that endurance exercise does. Cortisol is a stress hormone, and if you're constantly running marathons and stuff like that, your body's going to be flooded with, with cortisol, and it is not how we are evolved to um, exercise. We're not evolved to run marathons and do these long you know, endurance exercises. Um, HIT training gets blood flowing, it gets energy up, and it's the best thing to do first thing in the morning. So every morning, I exercise. That is either going to the gym, doing yoga, or doing um, cardio on the elliptical or the stationary bike, meaning low impact cardio that's not going to hurt your knees. And that is a great way to start the morning, and it's a great way to get the blood flow going, and it's great to start the day off with a battle, okay? It's going to set the tone for the rest of your day that... You know, you're not avoiding, you're not trying to fall back into your comfortable lifestyle. You're ready to fight, you're ready to go. And I 100% recommend do some type of exercise every day and do it in the morning and do it with the caffeine and the water and the fasting and all those things together makes you feel great, all right? Next up, stress-free living. So stress-free living is extremely important this is a key one it's not always possible especially if you have a high stress job but you you have to do what you can to minimize it okay and that means if you need to get a new job and and even better start your own business do it because stress causes state destroyers like anxiety and adrenaline dumps so you got to work on positive reframes outcome detachment and removing yourself from stressful situations that means not working a stressful job and getting rid of negative, stressful people in your life. So if you are just new to this stuff, the best way to start eliminating stress is eliminate stressful situations and stressful people. That'll be, that can be a 50% improvement right there. Which leads me into the next point here, which is, um, which is going to be not doing, uh, uh, sorry, positive thinking and thought reframing. So you are what you tell yourself. And when you tell yourself negative things, they will store in your body. You will literally be able to feel that in, when I have a negative thought or an anxious thought, I feel it in my diaphragm and I feel it on both sides of my stomach. And it usually presents itself as like a low grade nausea and it's not a pleasant feeling. If you can't be positive at the time, you have to do your best to at least avoid negative thinking because it if you don't, it's gonna easily spiral into a depressive state. And you need to be aware of the physical triggers as well as the mental triggers. So if I feel something in my body, I'm going to explore that and I'm going to become aware of it. And many times just becoming aware of the thought um, will dissipate that negative energy or becoming aware of, of the the feeling in your stomach or wherever it is will dissipate that negative energy. And so this means taking negative thoughts, analyzing them, asking them, how is this useful to me? And if, if it's not useful to, to you, then you discard it. So think of some key reframes to the trigger points that I've listed and as well as some key reframes to your own personal trigger points. And you know, have those on tap so you're able to access them whenever you are um, being attacked by these negative thoughts. Next up, having a mission. Every man needs a mission. 
A mission allows you to overcome obstacles. A mission gives you purpose. A mission gives you tunnel vision from negative thoughts. A mission projects a positive reality for your future. And focusing on your mission is an awesome way to channel your energy away from negative thoughts. It allows you to reframe your suffering as positive. So when I'm doing some really hard projects on on my on RLD, I know that I'm suffering for something that I'm building. I'm not giving that money, that suffering away to some guy who's going to profit off my labor. I am, you know, when I wrote an ebook, it, it took a lot out of me, but, you know, six months later, a year later, it's paying for me um, in passive income when I wake up every morning. So all that suffering becomes a positive. And guys, at the end of the day, if you don't have a mission in life, you have to have one, okay? Because when you have a mission, that gives you a reason to wake up every morning. When you don't, you don't have a reason to get up because you are not building something, right? And it's going to be very easy to slip into a pleasure-seeking, comfort-seeking, um, escape-seeking mentality. So if you need to get that mission, you know, you don't have one, check out the site. I've got a bunch of articles on how to get that together. Next up, not, not doing things you hate, similar to what I mentioned above, your job, social functions, hanging out with people who don't respect you, playing an image you don't feel because society compels you. Just stop doing these things as much as you can and, and you're going to notice how much better you feel. Next point, managing your, your reality. That means don't have coworkers or minimize your time with them. Um, minimize your time or cut off negative family members. Cut off negative relationships, negative friendships. It's much harder to manage reality with negative people pressuring you to conform. And it also means that you should avoid negative media, movies, and news. I stopped watching the news a long time ago, right? All, they, all the news is, is is getting you to watch through outrage or fear or negative images because our reptilian brains respond to that. They respond to these our threat sensors. And if you are... We are not designed as beings to consistently process the amount of suffering that's in the world. Okay, We're designed to live in small tribes and be relatively oblivious of what's going on in the rest of the world. We're, but in this information age, you could consistently, 24 hours a day, read and watch and hear about people starving in Africa. And that's going to make you want to kill yourself. Okay, So you need to get rid of all the negative media that you can. A good way to go that do that is try like going on a positivity diet for a month. Only read positive sites, only read positive articles, only watch positive movies. And I'm telling you, you're never going to want to go back. Okay. Um, avoid negative media like the plague, negative people like the plague, and manage your reality as best as you can. Next point, mindfulness. This means consistently watching and monitoring your, monitoring your state by making the subconscious conscious. Now this gets easier with practice and your mind will automatically send you red flags on negative thoughts. Um, pretty much speaks for itself. Next point, having an achievement mentality. Make a promise to yourself that from now on you've transitioned to an achievement mentality. And that means getting high on, instead of getting high on food and drugs and porn and video games or any other escape from reality, you're going to create an, a reality that you don't want to escape from and you're going to get high on what you achieved that day and what you achieved in terms of building that reality and you're going to use the mentalities and the routines and the structures on my site to give you a laser-like focus in achieving your mission and goals. Next point, self-acceptance. So you're going to try as best as you can to look back positively on all the things that you've going for yourself. Now, this is easier than said said than done, and, and then I'll admit it's a difficult thing for me, but, you know, it's better, better than nothing, okay? Even if you can't fully accept yourself, if you can improve 10%, 15%, even 5%, you need to try speaking to yourself in a language of acceptance and focus on the things that you're good at instead of, I'm worthless, I'm a piece of shit, I'm... I'm no good, okay? You are, you are the person that you tell yourself, 
you are, okay? You are how you talk to yourself. And, and you need to try and talk to yourself like you would talk to a good friend, okay? Not yelling at, at like, would you talk to a good friend and say you're worthless, you're a loser, you know, these horrible things that you've been programmed by your parents to tell yourself, you know, you have to get rid of that and, and look, at, look upon yourself with as much acceptance as you can. Next point, structure. Keep a daily routine. Be organized. Go to bed early. Get up at the same time every day. This is a massive change that I made and is a massive um, improvement in my quality of life and massive, massively important if you are trying to develop an achievement mentality and you're on a mission. Okay, This brings order and stability and allows you to focus on your mission and gives you a sense of pride and control over your environment. So have a look in my lifestyle section on, on the site and I break down exactly how to do that. It's really only, you only read, need to read three posts and I'll break down my exact structure to put your life on autopilot. Next point, multiple areas of self-esteem. So you need to take pride in many areas of your life, not just one, okay? A lot of people like, you know, guys who are like pro bodybuilders, you know, that's the only thing they care about. And if they feel small that day, then that's going to fuck up their whole day because their mind is not, is so focused on one thing, it starts producing unreality, okay? You need to take pride in multiple areas of your self-esteem. So, you know, it could be your mission, your career, your presence, your style, your fitness, your relationships. And that means if if one area is outside of your control at that particular time and you're failing in that one particular area, then you can still receive plenty of self-esteem from the others. So for example, let's say you fail at hitting your goal in the gym. Okay, you know, you might be um, a bit bummed out about that. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna go ec work extra hard on your business that day and get things done that, that might have taken you two days and that's gonna return that sense of balance. So whenever your, your self-esteem is feeling out of balance in one area and that area is outside of your control, then go into the other areas and make it back up and try and spread spread your self-esteem across multiple areas, okay? So I have my looks, my style, my fitness, my intelligence, my business, helping others, um, and I'm not telling you to be arrogant about this stuff, but I'm saying, you know, you, you wanna be telling yourself good things and, and you wanna be feeling good every day and you wanna remind yourself of the things you have going in different areas instead of just being hung up on one. If you're only hung up on one area and you only care about one thing and you only see yourself worth in one thing, when that thing doesn't work out for you and there's always gonna be times where that's where you're gonna struggle in one area, then it's gonna destroy your mood. So it's like hedging your investments, right? You don't wanna put all your eggs in one basket. You wanna diversify. So diversify your areas of self-esteem. Lastly, sitting or standing up straight. Now, I do not sit up straight all the time, but I stand up straight all the time. And I try and do as much of my work standing up as possible. I'm standing up doing this podcast right now, and you, there's a major difference in my energy from when I'm sitting up to when I'm standing up. So I do all my podcasts standing up. I try and do the majority of my writing standing up. In fact, I don't allow myself to sit down until after lunch. So from 6 a.m. when I get up to about 2 p.m., I'm standing up, and that is when I get the bulk of my work done. Standing up straight is the physical embodiment of your most powerful state, um, whereas standing hunched over is what self, low self-esteem people do, okay? The guy who walks with a hunched back and his head down, he's literally apologizing for his existence. Whereas the guy who stands up straight, shoulders back, chest out, that guy is saying, I'm comfortable with myself. I'm comfortable presenting a confident person to the world. I'm not afraid of the world. I expect respect. And that is your natural posture. You will notice when you start standing up straight consistently, you're going to have a big increase in your energy. Standing up straight also sends cues to your body, giving you an increased projection of power. And most people don't do that if you watch them. Sitting up straight is something I try to do, but I'll be honest with you guys, I don't, I don't do that 100% of the time. Um, my cure for sitting up is 
straight because it is it is hard to, on the back is I just try and sit as little as possible um, if I'm gonna sit it's gonna for a long period of time it's usually gonna be it'll here's what I'll do say around 2 p.m. I'm a bit tired after lunch and I'm gonna make my way over to the couch I'm gonna bring my laptop and I'm gonna put my feet up and I'm gonna sit in like a half slumped posture which is not a great posture and I'm gonna do that for about two hours until my back starts to hurt and I'm gonna do some work um, sitting down because that's what the first dip in my energy but once my back starts to hurt I'm gonna get stand up and then I'm going to stretch out with um, resistance bands and I'm gonna use my Theracane and give myself a back massage and then I'm gonna move back over to standing up and I'm gonna try and stand up until dinner time and once I get to dinner or or um, if I'm still too t if I'm still too t tired to stand up I'll go lie down on the bed and do some work there because lying straight without a pillow underneath your neck is is perfectly fine for your back um, I'll only do that if I'm feeling really low energy because it is a low energy position. So I, I'll lay down for a little while, conserve my energy, build it back up. I might fall asleep for half an hour and then I'm going to get back up and I'm going to have my energy and I'm going to move back to standing until dinner time. Then I'm going to go grab dinner and I'm going to sit and I'm probably going to hunch over the table while I eat my dinner and read something online. And then after dinner, I'm going to move back to the couch. But the good thing is I'm only going to be up for another hour, maybe two hours at the most. I'll probably do some reading online, maybe a bit of work, and then go to sleep. So to instead of forcing myself to sit up straight all day, really what I do is I just try and sit as little as possible. Because even sitting up straight, it's still sitting in one period, sitting in one place, for a period of time is not good for you. If you can, you want to stand up as much as possible, um, which is why having a corporate job, another reason why having a corporate job is, is so terrible. You're sitting all day in the same posture. You want to stand up, you know, get the blood flowing, stretch out a little bit, and, and try and sit as little as possible. And if you are going to sit, try and sit up straight or um, use the strategies that I do. But standing up straight is 100%. You got to do that. Okay, so those are the daily lifestyle hacks that you wanna be doing on a consistent basis. Now I'm gonna give you the state boosters. These are specific things that you can do that will work um, quickly and are effective. The stuff like no ejaculation are more cumulative and structure and self-acceptance. Those are stuff that have, that you need to do consistently over, you know, a medium period of time to a long period of time to start feeling the effects but what I'm gonna give you now is state boosters that you will feel immediately so the first one is affection now affection directly raises your uh, levels of oxytocin which is the chemical that makes you feel warm and su uh, fuzzy and a lot of guys especially in the dating community and the men's self-improvement community don't really realize that you have affection needs as well not just sexual needs so you <laughs> Most guys, you're going to need to feel 100%. You're going to need to at least cuddle a girl once a week, okay? I don't have a lot of affection needs, but I feel better when I cuddle a girl once a week. Now, the best way to do that is, you know, to have, you know, a girl that you care about in your life and you see her maybe once or twice a week and you have a good cuddle, usually after sex, for like a couple hours. But one thing you got to watch is too much affection. And too much cuddling actually has a negative impact. At least it does in my case. You start to feel um, like too comfortable. You start to feel a bit too soft. You you start to feel like you don't really want to face the outside world. So for me, I don't like to cuddle too much. I like I am for me once a week for you know lying in bed for like three four hours with a girl is perfect. Um, I don't need much more than that. And you just gotta you got to be careful like like all things you know everything in moder moderation but judge how you feel um, and just remember that you have emotional needs as well as sexual needs and that doesn't make you a pussy next up cold shower this is 
one of the best ways to immediately increase your energy and immediately increase your resistance to depression and your mental state. So you can start with a warm shower, but finish with 30 seconds of cold. Five on the head, 10 on the chest, and 10 on the back, and then five on the head again. And for a long period of time, I did this every morning. It's refreshing, it gives you an adrenaline rush, and it gives you an energy boost. Even a warm shower makes you feel better. If I'm in a, if I'm in a bad mood, a lot of the times I'll just have a warm shower, um, and that will make you feel better. It gets the blood flow going. Water is, is a brilliant thing. And if you want to step that up to the next level, then drop the cold shower for 30, 45 seconds, and you're going to feel amazing. It doesn't matter how depressed you are at that moment. I, that will 100% work every time. Next point, sprinting. Um, now, you guys know that I don't like sprinting. And the reason I, don't, I tell guys not to do it is because it's bad for your knees. Um, for, your, for your high intensity cardio, I suggest that guys do uh, elliptical and stationary bike. However, they just do not have the emotional impact of sprinting. For whatever reason, I don't get the runner's high on the elliptical and I don't get the runner's high on the stationary bike, but I get a big runner's high on the, on the treadmill if I go for a sprint, okay? And the reason you get that is because your body senses pain and it releases endorphins, which are nature's natural painkillers. And that gives you a big boost in your state. It's like, it's like taking a low level opiate and if you really go all out in the sprint there's like a, a period of like a minute or two where you start to feel like some kind of demigod like you could take on the entire world and nothing can stop you and I'm telling you if, if you are feeling low hop on that treadmill go hard push yourself past the wall and once you get past the wall you will get into that runner's high and it feels amazing and that's gonna last It'll reverberate throughout the day, but just try and avoid doing that too often because it is hard on your joints. Next point, reading or listening to motivational media. This is crucial. The human brain is a sponge and the more positively, the more positivity you're around, the more positivity you feel. Even a Tony Robbins book, which has a lot of generic advice or one of these generic motivational sites is 100% better than almost everything out there. Even if it's like retard positivity, your brain is a sponge and it will, an immersion in that will affect your mood positively. Um, if you've been reading a lot of negativity stuff, I suggest you do a positivity fast for a month and see how much better you'll feel. Next point, Fenibit. Uh, you can have a look at the, the video I do on Fenibit or, or the links on my site. Fenibit in moderation is the best drug I've taken for lifting mood. It's a GABA agonist similar to alcohol without the cognitive side effects of lethargy. And on moderate dose Fenibit, you'll notice an increase in energy, relaxation, happiness. Music sounds amazing. Uh, have a look at my site for the dosing schedule. Really the way you do it is you take like a gram on an empty stomach in the morning combined with caffeine and you don't eat for three, four hours. And the Fenibit is gonna peak, you're gonna notice it with about four, four hours in, and then it's gonna last almost the entire day. But be careful with this one, okay? This is not something you can use every day. This is a few times a week at the most. The withdrawal stories for guys who started using this every day are horrible. This is a legal supplement for now, but it's a very pain, it's a very, um, powerful drug, so you should be careful using it. And if you have had a problem with substance abuse, especially alcohol abuse, do not use this drug, okay? Um, only use this drug if you have discipline and you are able to control um, your substances. And next up, the other state booster, which um, which I combined with Fenibit, is caffeine. And caffeine I take every single day. Okay, now a lot of people will tell you not to do that because you build a tolerance, but my life is better with caffeine even though I have a high tolerance to it than it is without it. And it is way better. Now, I'm still on the lookout 
for drugs that I can use on alternate days so that I could use caffeine every three days and then another drug on, on uh, the other four days. But I haven't found one yet, unfortunately. So caffeine is an awesome drug. It is my favorite drug and it works consistently every day and the tolerance is still only mild. I've been, I've been taking caffeine forever and I'm on 200 milligrams a day but I still get a good result out of that. Um, with that said, if you don't take caffeine every day, the results are even stronger. If you, were, if, you, if you don't take caffeine often and you take like a 100 milligram or 200 milligram pill, you're going to feel like a powerful result. Um, the best way to take it is in the morning with a ton of water because that's going to negate the diuretic effects. And it's a good thing to take caffeine at lunch with, one of your, with your meal to avoid the, mid, the midday dip in state where you get tired after lunch. Next state booster is laughter. Going out with your buddies who can make you laugh is a great state booster, especially when you're feeling down. But the most consistent thing, because your buddies are not always available, is throwing on a, on a comedy or a YouTube video. Um, for me, I'll throw on a Family Guy video, and that can put me in a good state for like 10 or 20 minutes, or watching like Louis C.K. Or, or something like that. You know, go 10, 20 minutes of... Um, watching something funny and and you'll be surprised at how how quickly your state can change and finally the last state booster is music um, powerful uplifting music is awesome for state boost I go most places if I know I have something boring to do I'm gonna go there with headphones so that I can keep my state up and every morning when I wake up I throw the headphones on and I put powerful uplifting music um, you know, I pump that into my head, and that is a great way to start the day. And on the flip side, you definitely want to avoid depressing music. If you are the kind of guy who listens to like sad indie music, you need to cut that out because that I could put on sad indie music, and within thirty minutes, I'll notice my state dropping by you know as much as fifty percent. So, music is a powerful tool and you want to use it positively so now that we've got your lifestyle hacks and your state boosters we are on the final point here and this final point is what to do if you've fallen into a depressive state so you are in a depressive state we are now in damage control we are now in code red okay you need to recognize you need to recognize that you're in a, a danger in in the danger zone. Okay, you need to recognize that. Okay, I'm in a depressive state. We now have a serious problem, and I need to stop everything that I'm doing and focus on getting out of the state. Okay, this is very very important. And the way to do it is, you're gonna have to fight your way out. So, here are the things that I recommend for fighting your way out. Um, you might be able to use all of them or you know you might be able to use some of them try them all whatever um, and then you're gonna have your things that work better than others so the first one is anger in many ways being depressed is rage turned inwards okay and a lot of people will tell you to avoid anger all the time and I don't I don't agree with that anger can be useful um, every Almost every emotion can be useful except for depression. Okay, depression has absolutely no use. But anger can be useful because you can harness that rage and let it motivate you. Okay, you can be depressed about thinking um, about your life or thinking about people who have treated you negatively. And you can use that rage to motivate you. And you can use that rage to, to you know, start thinking about what a success you're going to be and to start thinking about how those people who doubted you are going to have to eat their words and and you're going to be pissed off that you have to deal with this depression and you're going to be pissed off and you're not going to let yourself be a slave to it and you're not going to have another day become destroyed and you're going to use that anger and focus towards your obstacles and you are going to fight and you're going to strive and you're going to kick and you're going to claw your way up to a natural to a neutral mood because you're pissed off and you're not going to take it anymore okay and don't make the mistake of trying to, you know, 
get into a super happy mood. The mood you're going for is neutral. You just need to get out of the depressive state because the depressive state is a dangerous place to be. And the longer you're in it, the worse it gets. Number two, don't future plan. And, tr- and, and don't think about your future plans. Depression means you're in mental survival mode, and that means regrouping and directing all your energy to lifting your present state. Trying to make future plans in a depressive state is horrible, is a horrible thing to do. All your future dreams are gonna seem hopeless and stupid. Every single positive thing in your life is gonna seem hopeless and stupid and inconsistent, and if you are trying to plan your business goals and things like that in a depressive state, it is going to be impossible because you're not gonna have any type of belief in anything that you're thinking. So do not future plan. Instead, use use the tactics to get out of that mental survival mode. Next up, waiting, okay? This means telling yourself that this is a temporary state and that it'll soon pass. Um, telling yourself that, that the reality you're experiencing is not objective. So what that can mean is if you're trying all the things and they're not working, what you might have to do is just say, you, you talk to yourself gently, you know, sort of like, okay, hey, we're gonna be in this for a while, we just have to wait it out, okay? It's gonna get better, it's gonna be better tomorrow, um, you know, we just have to keep waiting. And every time you start having a depressive thought, you start, you, you, you think like this, okay, I, I acknowledge that depressive thought, I'm in a depressive state, this is a temporary state, and I'm just gonna have to wait it out. Okay, another good thing to do is just is tell yourself, okay, I just have to wait it out until the end of the day, right? You're just trying to get through the day and then you're saying, okay, at night I'm gonna get to go to sleep and I'm gonna wake up and I'm gonna feel way better. And almost always when you wake up the next day, you're gonna feel better, especially if you go to bed early. And you're like, okay, I just gotta get through the day. I just gotta get through the day to the nighttime. And a lot of the time this takes the expectations off of changing your mood and sometimes, you know, Waiting it out is all you have to do. It's just as long as you're not further going into the deeper depression. Next point, um, thought blocking. So more important than positive thinking is avoiding negative thinking. And that means fighting hard when you recognize yourself going to a depressive spiral. So, you know, in a lot of ways, meditation and being mindful is, is helpful in your daily life. But... That's only until it's not helpful. And for me, when I find, when I'm depressed, a lot of the time meditation is not helpful to me. You guys might have noticed that too. If it is helpful to you, um, mindfulness is always good. But for me, when I'm depressed, I wanna be mindful, but I also wanna aggressively fight back against those negative thoughts. So that can be telling those thoughts to fuck off or it can be recognizing a downward negative spiral and just saying, nope, 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 nope. Just like, you know, not gonna deal with that, not gonna listen to that, um, not gonna go through that tunnel. You know, you're just like actively fighting back like a soldier, you know? Um, and I think our our um, culture these days focuses too much on um, having an open mind and letting every single thought in. There's a lot of times where you need a closed mind and you need to shut those thoughts out and you say, you know, you're not getting in here today, okay? Um, you know, that is an effective tool. Thought blocking is is crucial, I found, when you're in the middle of depression and you're just telling those thoughts like, no, you, you are not going to have this effect on me. I'm not gonna deal with that. I'm not going to... Um, you know, be subject to that, and you're and you're gonna fight back against um, those negative thoughts. Okay, and finally, the last thing is using one of the state boosters. So, the state boosters that I listed in the previous section: affection, cold shower, sprinting, listening to motivational media, phenibit, caffeine, laughter, or music. Those are all great things to do when you're in a depression, or using one of them or all of them whatever you feel is best and that is it guys so as i said before this is the most important article and the most important audio that i have on my site Um, this is something that i want you to use as a reference manual okay 
feel free to print it up or save it in your Evernote and look at it um, so that when you feel these states coming up, you know how to handle it and you know what to do. Because I'm telling you, I've been there and you are not alone, okay? You might think you're the only guy who's dealing with this, but I'm telling you, there's so many guys that are dealing with this and they're dealing with it quietly. And it does not make you a pussy. It, it means that you've gone through pain and you might have had a tough childhood and those effects linger, okay? And the good thing is you have control over this. You are the creator of your own reality and you can control how you feel when you take responsibility for your state. And I strongly suggest that you do that and, and you know, read this over, read it two, three times if you have to, listen to the audio two or three times if you have to. I'm telling you from personal experience, I've been there and done that and it can and does get better. And the quality of your life can go up to such a degree that you won't even believe how happy you can be consistently and you won't believe the way that you used to live, okay? I promise you that. With that said, guys, don't ever hesitate to email me, will at revolutionarylifestyledesign.com if you're going through something, okay? Um, you know, I can't give medical advice and if, and if it's really heavy, you're gonna have to deal with a therapist, but I can always um, offer my thoughts and I'm always gonna be there for you guys, especially for guys who are going, for who, who are struggling with this because I know what it's like, I, I won't forget what it's like and I've been there and done that and, and I've got past it. So never hesitate to reach out to me on this. With that said, I wanna thank you for listening and as always, I wish you all the best.